Welcome to India. If you go to the southern state of Tamil Mandu, we find the city of Thanjavur. For the past 70 years, the E.D. Thomas Memorial Higher Secondary School has been teaching, training, and introducing students and teachers to Christ. Most of our church leaders in this region receive training from this school. The 2,350 students come from a variety of family backgrounds and religions, all longing to get a good education. Most of the children, they're coming from very, very poor background. But it is our duty to uh, give the moral support to the children, building the character building. That is our motto. No one to live in this school without education, without God's uh, spiritual power. That's what they, that is our duty. Surrounded by other schools, this school offers unique values that attract parents. There are so many schools around here, but parents bring here. Nearby also parents bring here, just because we are teaching discipline and uh, about God. Due to its age, this school faces serious problems with its facilities. The girls' uh, hostel it is not secure because the building is very old. The government very strictly ordered do not have the asbestos seat roof because it is affect the children. The government very strictly ordered to demolish the oldest building and especially in the asbestos seat. Miralini is one of the students staying in the girls' dorm. Coming to this school was a challenging experience because she needed to travel far from home. Even though she didn't come from an Adventist background, she made good friends in the dorm, learned about God, and excelled in class. She still admits there is room for improvement. Yeah, we need some improvement because the hostel is not with concrete walls. It's as per should. In summer days, we are feeling so hard. We have to change this, and the toilet is not enough for us. We need some more rooms and some facilities there. This quarter, a portion of your 13th Sabbath offering will help renovate the girls' dorm at E.D. Thomas Memorial Higher Secondary School, providing the students with a safer place to stay. Please pray for the students and teachers at this school. Pray that this school can effectively represent Christ despite their current situation. Thank you for supporting 13th Sabbath offering for eSchool. Sabbath, everyone. Good morning, thank you. Happy Sabbath. Today is a special day. We are going to have our children ministering here for the Sabbath school. And they are going to start our worship. And would you like to praise the Lord together? Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath school song service. To begin, we will sing song number 593 in times like these. Okay, but let's pray first. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the Sabbath day and please bless the songs, songsters and please help us to enjoy the songs and just in my pray, amen. Yes, we will begin with song five, five, nine, three, in times like these. Oh 
Continue to praise the Lord with number 249. Praise Him, praise Him.
in our lives every day and we will sing number 537 he leadeth me
to come here. We are going to sing one, al one of our favorite songs we used to sing in the class. Primary class. I see your faces and your smile. Would you like to see your face too? Okay, Ola, Jojo, Nala, Abishai. Abish um, David, I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy.
you're going to share with them one of the three Bibles, Bibles verse we have been practicing and memorizing during the quarter. Amen. Thanks, primary class. It was wonderful. Now we are going to see our junior class here. Let, Let your light so shine before men, men that, that they, they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 6, 16.
the next Bible verse is the other Sabbath school memory text, Psalms 27, 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. It's not easy to wait, and I have to say that sometimes it's painful. Perhaps one of the greatest stress in life is the stress of waiting. No matter who we are, where we live, what our station in life is, we all, all at times must wait for things. It's not easy to wait. But as Christians, we have the privilege, or I would say the blessing, to learn how to wait on the Lord. And this week, I know that through the Sabbath school, we had the opportunity to learn more how to wait on the Lord. We are going to separate in class now, and I pray that God will bless us as we are going to go in a deep study about how to wait on the Lord. And before to separate, we are going to talk with Jesus. Dear Lord, thanks for this day. Please speak to us, help us. Help us to listen to you, to listen to your word, and to be patient to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And just a note, for the primary class today, we are going to be in the gym this morning, okay? It's saturated enough, so they were afraid that uh, we we're going to have a lot of forest fires this year. But here, look at that rain. Hey, no be no fire fires. <laughs> it's so wet, you can burn anything in there. So anyway, um, I'm glad you guys here, you made it here. And uh, I heard quite a few people got sick, so I'm glad you guys didn't get sick, so it's good. You know how the wet weather, damp weather, like warm, cold at night, 
kind of gives a little bit of sore throat and stuff. So I'm glad you guys here. And uh, so, uh, anything this this week? Like any thanks? Kind of what good things that happened this week for what you guys want to praise? You know, uh, share your experience that we may be encouraged. I guess, um, yeah, yeah, it's it's working, it's okay, working. Yeah, it's, it's just for the online. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, 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 no. I guess um, I'm praising God because my s my yeah. sister, my sister and uh, her husband made it here safely. Yeah, that's good. So praise God for that. Yeah, it was a long journey, right? And they left right on Friday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like at one a.m., so they yeah they got through the journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So How long it took them to get here? Like sixteen hours? Something like that. Yeah. They wow. Took a break also. Wow. So. Have ever, has anybody ever done 16 hours straight drive? Yeah. 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 My longest one was 22. Straight. Yeah. You when you when you're done after 16, 20 hours, you walk out from the car. You like you square. You feel you square. <laughs> like it's. it's <laughs> but uh, you know, sometimes we have to persevere, right? You had something. Um, I also wanted to add, um, so my mom went to France to yep. help my grandma with um, her diabetes. And basically, she went on a plant-based diet and okay. started exercising. And um, my mom told us that now she's off her injections. Oh, wow. And so the doctor said, like, she doesn't need to take it anymore because she's doing so well. So I praise God for that. That's nice. That's nice. That's, uh, that's beautiful. Praise the Lord. You see? Same with what our prophet said. Like, we use health, natural remedies not in denial of faith, but with the faith, right? Because we believe that God told us, you do this, it's going to get better. So when we do that with prayer, we get better, and then we can praise God for, for it. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful thing. So we'll open with a word of prayer, and then we'll go into the lesson. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a beautiful day. Thank you that we are able to make it to your uh, house of praise, and that we are here and um, open your word right now we need your holy spirit dear lord without your holy spirit we cannot understand the word because the word says the spiritual things spiritually discern so we pray that your holy spirit will enlighten us that will open the word for us that we might understand and not only understand but apply to our lives that we might be ready at your coming in jesus name we pray amen so the lesson for this week was wait on the Lord. And I know some people, right? Some people know, that's fine. Um, but the subject of waiting, it's everybody familiar with subject of waiting. Like somebody ever, you know, we had experience in our life that we had to wait. Test results, exam results, um, parents coming, loved ones coming surgery recoveries like you name it there are all kinds of subjects we've been waiting how's the feeling of waiting how is that <laughs> don't be shy good <laughs> don't be shy man we all talk here that's that's the place we talk so how's it feeling sometimes it can be very stressful stressful you Some feel that you have to do something you know we always learn that you know we have to do and solve any problem or situation that might arise and it seems to be that it's not just us it's from the beginning you know people couldn't wait yeah so stress so couldn't wait in patience what you waiting for like you wait for exam but you can do not pass like you can fall this exam or mm -hmm. you wait about your parents what they say mm -hmm. like they come back at home mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it when we talk about waiting, it usually brings those I don't wanna say very negative emotions, but usually it's kinda like doesn't really bring you a much smile. Even if it's a good event, right? Even if you're waiting for something good, the <laughs> the fact that you have to wait, you have to exercise patience, you have to exercise self control because you have to wait for it. So um in this lesson, like uh, Sister um, Vivian just said, that we looked at, the, at at David how he 
how he advises us what would be the best way to wait, what our attitude should be for waiting, what, um, uh, what our emotional state should be when we wait for something, especially when we wait for the Lord, right? Because this is a, at the end, that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for him to come back, right? Or sometimes we're waiting for him to answer our prayers, you know, like David, when David was praying, he was waiting to answer, the, he was praying for like deliverance or health or his kids. And he had to wait. So um, let's start with the memory verse. Let's read Psalm 27, 14, and let's see, let's see what we can get from it. Psalm 27, verse 14. Mm -hmm. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Amen. Amen. So what's the first advice when we wait? Well, I, I don't think it's an advice. I think it's a promise. Okay. Or, or maybe uh, advice. Be of good courage. Promise, command. <laughs> yeah, be, of, be of good be courage. Be of good courage, okay. Yes, because, you know, we get disheartened. We, uh, you know, if it's too long and this uncertainty puts us, tests really our faith. Okay. What, from this verse that we just read, what else, like, what the waiting will produce, so to say, in this verse, there's answer in this verse. When you're waiting, what it will produce? says, um, he shall strengthen thine heart. So he shall you say. wait and you are of good courage, God will strengthen our heart. Amen. So our heart will become stronger. What the medical community tells you when you're nervous and you're stressful? It will affect your heart. It affects your heart. <laughs> right? It affects your heart. Isn't it true? Like when you're nervous, your heartbeat goes up and you have like, some, many people have heart attacks, right? When there's something bad happens. But here we have a recipe for the strengthening of the heart. What? The recipe we just heard? Being of good courage. So when we wait with a good attitude, with a good courage, that would actually strengthen our heart instead of weakening the heart. Yes, because it will give you peace. When it gives says, peace. When God says, wait, it me, you, and you learn this waiting, uh, it gives you peace knowing that the Lord will take care of it. So what I like in here in the, in the second paragraph, it says here, waiting on the Lord is not an idle and desperate bidding of one's time. Okay? So, and I guess that's where many of us fail. I do sometimes too. When we just sit idly, doing nothing, waiting, we are more emotionally prone to be down, depressed. That's where the depression comes, right? Like why many people during like COVID time, many people were depressed. Why? Because they were locked down in the houses. They didn't do nothing. They idly sat in the houses. So depressions went through the roof, right? So when we talk about when, <clears throat> when um, David is saying here, be of good courage. Wait on him. It will straighten your heart. What do we think from the medical point of view? What strengthens the heart? Can somebody like think what, what will strengthen the heart from medical point of view? Exercise. Exercise straighten the, straighten the heart. So while you're waiting and the Bible says, while you wait of, with the good courage, it will strengthen your heart. So while you wait, go do something. Run around the block if you're in the town. If you're outside, if you live in the country, go, I don't know, clean up the brushes. Do something, you know. Make your hands busy so you're not always thinking about that waiting thing, right? Like in, in a bad connotation, let's say, if you're waiting for a bad result or something. Get yourself busy with I find it often with myself, like, you know, do something. Yes. If you don't mind, uh, wait, short, wait also means, uh, in the scripture, it means wait and anticipate to hope. Yeah. And, and if you, you're hopeful or you're anticipating, you're actually waiting for good stuff. 
Yes. Most times we don't anticipate our hope for bad things. Mm -hmm. So if it asks to wait in the Lord, it's asking to hope for good things. Yes. So hence the, the part where it says to be of good courage. Hope, be, be, be hopeful for good things to happen. That's what he's asking to do. Amen. But so I'm trying to see, I see what you're saying. I'm trying to see, can we take that and apply, let's say, when, when people anticipate some bad results or something bad? Can we take and be hopeful that, yes, it's going to be, maybe the answer will be bad, but yet the process of waiting not to be discouraged, not to be down, not to be depressed, because the Bible says in the Proverbs that the uh, contrite spirit dries up bones, right? So if the person, let's say, waiting for something bad, anticipate something bad, that one week of waiting, <laughs> it will make that result even worse, right? So, but I see your point. It's a good point that the scripture usually, like, especially when we talk about waiting on the Lord, we wait so for God to come. Exactly, it's a good thing. What exactly you wait? Aren't you waiting for the fulfillment of the promises that the Lord has given you? So I see it also in addition to what the brother has said. You know, as the Lord has promised and you believe the promise and you wait upon the Lord to fulfill its promise, you can act in faith and trusting and you start doing as the Lord had said that he will do. You know, you work, um, act in faith, waiting of the, on the Lord to fulfill his part that needs to be done. Okay. Now let's make a step back. Oh, we have a JB there. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, while we're waiting, we have a mission as well. Our mission is to tell the others that Jesus is coming soon, so we're just not waiting and sitting, but we have work to do as well. So that's, my, that's what I want to make a step back and say, what we are waiting for. Like, I think everybody's waiting. I think, I think everybody's waiting for different things. <laughs> there are sometimes we wait for temporal things that we need tomorrow, You're right? Like sometimes we wait for the answer to the work or something, a job or something. But in general, like what's your purpose of your life? What are you waiting in your life? What you are expecting from yourself in a life? Any... Any, 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 any courageous people here who wants to raise their hand and answer that weird question? <laughs> I don't give me the mic. I have one. Well, in general, we're waiting for the Lord's second coming. To okay, come. second coming, yes. But, you know, another portion, a big one, as I said, we wait on the promises of the Lord that he has promised to work in us and to fulfill in us his good pleasure, you know. So uh, once, I guess, once he works on that, then the other one, we are happily waiting for the second coming as well. And we will tell the people of his wonderful works in us and, you know, encourage the other ones to wait as well. So if I may paraphrase what you're trying to say is, as we go through our life, we compare ourselves to Jesus and we set different goals in him changing us. And as we're waiting for him to change us, we're waiting for him to say, say, we continue working. We're not idly just sitting. We continue working for us and for those around us. Morning. <laughs> okay. Let's look in some Psalms. Let's open Psalm 27. One can open Psalm 27, 14. Second can open 20, 37. 27, is our memory. Oh, yeah, sorry. 37, verses 7 and 9, and 39, verses 7. So we have two readers. One will be going 37, verses 7 and 9, and one will be doing 39, verse 7. says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. For evil doers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Amen. So this is talking about our d different type of waiting. So it shows on our what's going on around us. How many of you are happy with what is happening in I mean, the world? I think here it shows to wait upon the Lord to do the judgment in this earth. Right? Yes. So this is the question. Like, How many of us are happy here 
with what is happening in the world. And Anna, yeah, right, shut up. <laughs> now, people are not happy with what's happening, right? And we tend, to, I mean, we tend to complain. We're not happy when we see these mistreatments happening. We want to like, oh, punish this guy or that girl, whatever. But here, Psalmist says, wait, God knows. There is a verse which says, judgment is mine, says the Lord. You know? mm -hmm. So we have to wait upon the Lord to, you know, punish all the wickedness. Okay. Who, due time. Who has verse 39, 7? Yeah, go ahead. So it says, And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Okay. So this verse, what, what is the, uh, what's David is waiting for? Here? Well, he's waiting on God. On God. So now in the previous verse we just read, it was, you know, for the wicked to be punished and for the justice to be on planet here, he just waits on the Lord to answer his prayer. Well, and uh, when you read the next verse, it's also to deliver from the transgressions. But Yeah, 40, oh, I didn't say, to read the 40 verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Amen. So here is, I see here as a waiting for the Lord to answer our prayers. As I was studying, I was, I was, as I was studying this lesson, I saw that it's not only we who are waiting. Who else is waiting? The Lord is waiting. Who else is waiting? Angels are waiting. Romans eight verse nineteen. Let's go to Romans eight verse nineteen. Who has it? You can read it. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Okay. So who is waiting? Creatures are waiting. In what? In what expectation? earnest expectation because I think it says that the more people are sinning the more humanity sins the more uh, the, the, the more we sin the more the, cre the creation suffers in different diseases that are there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. amen so yeah as I was because I was looking at the uh, creation world like when i was reading this study i was like is it isn't it true like you know they take take little, little example of um, cat and mouth you know if we if we believe that genesis 1 says when god created everything was perfect and there was no death that's mean cat never ate the mouth right <laughs> so now we have a cat eating the mouth first of all i believe cat is not happy eating the mouth because there is not, the, the, the diet, his original diet is not there anymore. So he has no other choice but eating the mouth. And the second, the mouth is like, I'm being eaten. Like, it's no fun. So, like, both of them are waiting for whom? For us to, get, to make right with God. So if we care for little animals, like I know my little daughter, she cares for all the little animals, like little buggies and stuff. Oh, don't kill that bug. Don't kill that bug. Oh, they're good. They're good. No, they they bugs. <laughs> but in the sense that if you care for them, even little bugs or bigger animals, it should put more compassion in our hearts, and we must strive to end the suffering as much as we can by fixing ourselves with God and align ourselves with God. Right? Any more comments? Yeah. I also, also want to add in verse twenty-two. Yeah. It's, it shows the suffering that's going on. It says that we know that the whole creation groaneth and traveleth in pain together until now. And so it just shows like the current situation that we're in. 
And what words are they using? Groaneth. Isn't that like a deep, like, like down from the deep? Like it's it, it's a, it's actually like not bad, but very like. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like it's not simply like they suffer. You know, when we say suffer, it's kind of more general word. Here it's like more like emotional, emotionally deeply suffering, right? Like groaneth, like they like they can't wait anymore to stop this. So uh, please have mercy on the creatures. <laughs> Work on your characters because they are waiting. Yes, agonizing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to Psalm 131. And uh, there are a few things we'll look at in Psalm 131. It's a small psalm. So whoever has it, we can read it. It's only three verses. Anyone? Go ahead. So it says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty, neither do I exercise in myself exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of her mother of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. Amen. So how the child behaves with the mother? And when it says about wind child, what the, where is it in the life, this child? Well, he was just born. Yeah, he's still a baby, right? So how the baby behaves when the mother is around? All giggly, giggly. <laughs> and all happy because mother is around, right? So here what uh, David says, me with you. It's like a child, right? But also, when we talk about wind, when is the winning happening? The winning, it's when you're done drinking milk and you are able to digest more harder food, so to say. Digest more harder food. Solid Bible, food. Yes, solid food. The Bible does talk uh, spiritually when it says that you are a babe still drinking milk, when it says when there is strife and uh, um, arguments here in the church, and, um, and also of the doctrines, right? Uh, yes. Simple, simple yep. doctrines. And then when it says, Paul, I cannot give you more solid food because you're not able to digest. Let's read that, what you just said. It's First Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3. Okay, anybody there? Come on, guys. Everybody's there, but nobody's reading. <laughs> yes, thank you. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Amen. It's a big verse, eh? It's a big verse. Do we have here 40 years old babies? Oh, we have 50 year old babies here. I'm just saying that, you know, as long as we have in our hearts this strife, Not only within the church, but even within the family or at work. If you have the desire to strive, we're still sucking milk. 
I do sometimes. Guilty. <laughs> Mm-hmm. We are trying to grow in s to become better spiritually. Mm -hmm. But we also are very aware that earth mm -hmm. is cursed. Mm -hmm. And once you're living here, you're going to be struggling. Christ is judging you or is asking you to, while you wrestle with this carnal challenge, to do the best you can. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we, we think as children of God that um, we are so wretched that we will never be able to do good mm -hmm. while we're waiting. We have to be careful of stuff like that. If, you know, God is examining your motives, not necessarily the outcome or the final, you can only try to be as best as you're able to under each circumstance. And mm -hmm. that's what David was wrestling with at some point. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so while he's waiting, he will find himself in places doing things that he ought not to be doing. But he's still hopeful and waiting. And so we are in the same boat, wrestling with things. The Christ is asking us so while we wait to try and become better, be more like him, and, and understand until he comes, we won't be able to get it perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. When we if, we, if, you, if you're not getting perfect when he comes, he comes to receive his own into his own kingdom, right? Like he comes to receive his own into my kingdom. And he'll say, come in, thou good and faithful child. This First Corinthians 15 says the only thing will be changed is our body, not our character. So if you still have a strife in your life, if you still not good, let's say, with your son or like with your coworker, just one person, you know, 150 people around you, you're good. But that one person, boy, she gets you or he gets you. Bible says that that thing will not be changed. The, the only thing will be changed is our body, not the character. So f my understanding is that y Jesus have to change your heart before he comes. Because when he comes, you got to be like him. Not trying to be like him. If, if you see what I'm trying to say. Because even here, Paul says, you cannot understand the deeper things because you're still fighting among yourself. The Spirit cannot open for you deeper things. And that's where the David was happy. David was happy because he submitted himself to the Lord and God was able to open to him more things. And that's why when, that's when he said, like, I'm happy I'm wind because I don't have, I don't have that strife anymore. Because remember with Saul, how many people would act like David did with Saul? Saul wants to kill him for nothing. But yet David says, I'm not touching this guy. Like, I love you, man. Like, I don't want to do anything bad for you. Like, how many of you can do that to somebody around us who, like, at work or at home trying to provoke us, you know? So um, I think there is a lot of the spiritual growth. So the question is whether David loved, and then this question to the class, did David love Saul because he loved him as a person or he loved Saul because he was anointed? If we go back in the Bible, he say, because you have been chosen, anointed man okay. of God, so I am not allowed to touch you. That's what the Bible say. But in the reality, I don't know if it's because he was an Announced, or it's just because he don't want to do it. But he's the man of God. Mm -hmm. I will not touch you to mm -hmm. carry that heavy load on me. That's I, what I, the Bible says. I, I think one of the things I'm looking at is that oftentimes it's our Let motive. Let's use the mic. Let's yeah, the mic is here. Okay. It's a motive that, that God is really paying close attention to. Because you'll find yourself, like, like Paul, I think it was Paul who said, the things I should find myself doing, I'm not doing. And the things that I ought not to be doing is the things I find myself doing. Yes. But God understands your heart. He knows what you're wrestling with. And only him alone genuinely understands what you're struggling with. Amen. So, and, and those are my, this, this is the point I want to mm -hmm. try and, um, bring out. 
that while you understand where you are at and what you're struggling with, he's, you know, if you really cry out and wait upon him, which is what we're talking about, then he will help you to overcome those things. But it takes time. And I, I guess that's, that's the end result. At the end, we have to overcome. And that's in, in, in a quote from Paul when he says, things I don't want to do, I do. Things I don't want to do, I don't do. There is a comma. He says, but thank you for Jesus that helps me. You know, like, so as long as we're setting the reachable goals and we're overcoming and we see the change in our hearts. The willing to do good. And the other side of it, we have to take the example of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He came here not to do his will, his father's will, and he gave us the power so we can do good. We're not going to pitch out any small bad things. We try to be in the perfections as much as we can and because our heart is to do good, and God will provide us the tools to do better than what we're doing. So on this subject, as we overcoming, Psalm 126. Let's read in Psalm 126. Um, let's do, yeah, let's do all six verses. They're all connected with each other. So whoever have one, 126, all six verses, and we're on the same subject. We're on the subject of waiting on the Lord and in changing our character and his thing. Who has it? Everybody has it. Who, who wants to read it? <laughs> Psalm 126. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the hidden, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has gone great things. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth in and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Amen. Isn't that what we just discussed? Isn't that that when we... So with tears, we shall reap the joy. When we're sowing with the tears, when we struggle, struggle. And my examples of, you know, people around, it's the easy one, the hardest one here. You know, the hardest one is to control your emotions, to, to overcome the in, 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 in bad, bad traits. You know they're bad. I mean... I don't have to tell you what is bad. Everybody knows what is bad in their life. Like, I don't have to come to you and say, you're doing this bad. You, you know, you're doing this bad. You do No, Holy Spirit talks to you. Like, yes, there are much more for you to grow. But at that point, in order for you to continue growing, you have to overcome that what you're struggling with now. And Holy Spirit talks to each and every one that in order for you to step up and continue working, let me work on this big thing that is in the way. Because Jesus said, here I stand at the door and I knock. If anybody open the door. But most of the time we put so much garbage in front of the door that we can't open the door. So he says, clean up the garbage. We can open the door and let's talk. He said, let's sup together. What does it mean supping? Planning together, eating together. Will you invite to the table somebody you don't know? No, you will invite somebody that you want to spend time with, that you want to talk soul to soul, you know, that you want to know more about you. When we have people over, hey, what's your life been? Where, where you came from? What, what, what's going on with you? Where you want to have better conversation. So that's what Jesus wants to do with us. Yes. Um, in Matthew 5, verse 4, it says, talking about the mourning and bearing precious seed, mm -hmm. right? It says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. So here is the weeping. And who is the comforter, the one that comforts? It's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So when you mourn and you have that precious seed, the this Holy Spirit will fill your heart and will help you to nourish and to grow that that seed might bear fruit. And in the end, you have a... A whole harvest of sheep. Many joy. fruits. <laughs> sheep, sorry. <laughs> 
<laughs> Morning. <laughs> yes. Beautiful. Okay, so we have five more minutes. So uh, let's touch on the, um, the joy comes in the morning. So as we're working on our hearts, sorry, as God is working on our hearts and we're letting him work on our hearts. And I know we talk generic, generic terms, but take the generic term and apply it to whatever you're working with, like stealing cookies when they're hot. <laughs> I mean, I'm just giving you a stupid example, but take the generic term that we talk about and apply it to your thing that you're struggling with and work with God. He wants to show you that he more than able to help you in the thing that you're working with. Because believe me, I had experiences with the joy comes beautiful. At the end, the joy is nice. Um, so let's go to joy comes in the morning. Psalm, Psalm 5.3. Somebody find Psalm 5, 3, somebody find Psalm 35, 30, verse 5, and Psalm 5, 49, verse 14. So who has Psalm 5, verse 3? You know, if we ever play the game sword in your hands none of you in my team because you guys find the bible verse quickly but none of you reading <laughs> I'm reading from the new translation. yeah listen to my voice in the morning lord each morning i bring my request to you and wait expectantly amen so do what do we do in the morning what does he do in the morning Bring the request. <coughs> What's the second important step? You wait. You wait for the answer. You look for the answer. Sometimes we pray and then, <laughs> bye. No, if you put before the Lord request, wait for that answer. Throughout the day, be in your mind, I prayed about that. I need the help. Like let's say, you have a coworker who's really on your tippy toes. You pray about that person in the morning and throughout the day, dear Lord, I ask, please help, please help. You know, I'm looking for your help. And you will see that next time the person comes over, you don't have that feeling that you want to reply bad. In that moment, say, thank you, Lord. Acknowledge the answer. And that's how you go slowly, little by little, little by little, and it's, 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 it's a cool walk. It's a beautiful walk. Psalm 30, verse 5. Who has Psalm 30, verse 5? Amen. 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 Whoever is online, read it. Verse 30, verse 5. So, um, isn't it God good? That his anger is last how long? Just a moment. We have a lot to learn from him, right? <laughs> we'll have a lot to learn from him. Uh, but the joy comes in the morning. Let's read one more verse and I will have a question about joy in the morning. Uh, Psalm 49 verse 14. Forty nine verse fourteen. For sale? Oh, you didn't have forty nine fourteen. Where is the mic? The mic. 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 Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. Amen. So we talked a little bit about what happens in our life. Now, I think this verse brings this beautiful picture. What's going to happen at the 
Somebody said, and, good. What's going to happen at the end? The upright shall have dominion over the, the wicked. The upright will have dominion over. Remember we read that, um, uh, remember we read in the beginning uh, the verse from Psalm that, uh, Lord, how long you will keep justice, right? So hear the answer. The upright will have dominion in the morning. Yes, sister. And um, just to, I guess, elaborate on the joy comes in the morning. It, it, it is in comparison to us waiting what that morning is. And we know that the, we know the morning that we're waiting for. And that hope, that joy comes in the morning is what is going to give us hope to persevere until that morning comes and that joy comes. So, so that hope is what is going to get us through those fiery battles that we go through, those tragedies, those illnesses, whatever it is. That joy in the morning is the hope that is going to keep us until the end. Amen. So that will apply, like Sister just said, to our fiery trials. That will apply to everything that's happening with our life. And in general, as we're going to have a new quarterly for next week, uh, for next uh, three months, eh? Great controversy. So that applies to our great controversy that finally the battle between the good and evil will be over. The night will be done, Satan will be done, and righteous will possess the earth, right? There is a beautiful verse in the Bible where uh, they, uh, something nine, nine. Um, here is law, here is our God. We have waited for him, right? So in the, at the end, at the voice of God, the righteous will be happy. So, um, yeah. So it says, as we wait for God's fulfillment, our endurance will be tested, sometimes for hours, sometimes for years. But hope gives us the strength to be steadfast, no matter the duration or severity of our trial. Assuredly, hope is the attribute that keeps our eyes turned toward heaven as we await the second coming of Jesus. Amen. Those are big words. So uh, don't give up waiting. Wait in a positive attitude. And uh, we're here to help each other. So if anybody has, you know, difficulties waiting, we can wait together. Um, let's close with a prayer. The Lord, our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the lessons that you have given us. You have given us different tools and uh, you have given us encouragement. You have given us a hope as well. What are we waiting for? And uh, the Lord, please let us never forget what is coming up. And uh, as we're waiting for you, we know that dark day is here and it's going to get even darker. But we know that morning will come definitely. There will be a morning. We pray that we'll be found with you when you come. That, we, that you might wipe away every tear from our eyes. And that we might uh, be found also worthy to enter into your kingdom. Thank you so much for all the promises that you have given. And most important, thank you for fulfilling those promises in our lives. Let our walk with you be, be ever close. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming. Don't go too quick. I have some uh, quarterlies for, uh, for mem <gasps> members. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go.
our little care and perplexities as well as our greater troubles. Whatever arise to disturb or distress us, we should take it to the Lord in prayer. We are going to close our Sabbath school here in prayer. Would you like to say thanks to the Lord and to the parents who brings the, we are going to pray, who brings the little ones here every morning to spend time with Jesus studying the Sabbath school lesson. Let's talk to Jesus. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for saying that was to be good. Just that? You're fine? Are you okay? Cheers, Jesus. And to care of one another and and to be good to one another and to have a happy, happy day. And then Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful Sabbath.
I remember years ago when the phrase, girls can do anything became popular. I'm sure there was good intent in that phrase. Girls or women can run companies, have a career, be scientists or professional athletes or whatever they want. I don't think anyone would disagree as women at every strata of society have achieved great things. Something God values in a woman, and I hasten to add no doubt in a man as well, is found in Proverbs 31.10. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. And you know, rubies are really valuable. On her way to doing anything, or on his way, I think we can add, a young woman or young man needs to remember virtue, those qualities of true strength of character. Because whether you achieve your dreams or not, living virtuously in the sight of God Honestly, it's of far greater importance. I'm John Bradshaw for It Is Written. Dear friends, Our church is on a mission to broaden our outreach, carry forth the teachings of the Lord, and share His message of hope and love to many more. Our dream is to procure an 8-channel video mixer which will allow us to connect a larger number of devices, such as cameras and computers, and give us the capacity to offer richer, higher-quality broadcasts. With such advanced equipment, we can greatly enhance the quality and scope of our religious programs. This sophisticated device has a high price tag and we still have a gap of over $1,000 to cover to meet our target. We can only achieve this with your kindness and generous help. Every penny donated, no matter the amount, counts as a massive support towards our cause. Whether you contribute $5 or $500, every single dollar helps us get a step closer to reaching our goal. More importantly, your generosity allows us to expand our religious programs and impact more lives positively. Kindly make your generous contribution today and help us make a bigger impact. Remember, no act of kindness is ever wasted. Let's take the journey together in the faith of Christ, spreading His words and blessings far and wide. And this is how you can do it. In any browser type www.monktonsda.com In the top menu choose, Online Giving. From here scroll down until you will see, Live Stream Equip. Type the amount you would like to give and press, Continue to Donate. If you do not have an account set up, you can use Donate as a guest option. Thank you, for your support.
us pray. Dear Lord, we just want to thank you for joining mercy to be in your house another day. We just want to give you thanks and praise for everything that you have done for us. And as the lesson said this morning, wait patiently on you, dear Lord. Some of us are waiting for a different situation. Some of us are waiting for relief from pain. Some are waiting for financial relief. Whatever the situation that we are waiting for, I pray, dear Lord, that you will strengthen our faith and it will give us encouragement. And may we all gain a blessing that we came in search of. And may we leave here the same. And that blessing that we gain today, may we share with others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath, church. Okay, this side is awake. Happy Sabbath, church. All right, this side, almost there. We're trying the middle. Happy Sabbath, how are you doing? That, that, that's, that's much better there. All right, so this morning, uh, the thoughts is mine to welcome everyone to, to church. Uh, so we want to welcome our friends who are joining us online. So we know that there are many options that you could have chose, but you choose to join the Moncton Friends, and we are happy and delighted to have you. We want to welcome the Charles family who is watching us online this this Sabbath. Uh, we also have the Ricketts family who is watching us online. We have the Coons family and many others who are watching us online. And, and I feel so, I feel like I would sing a song for all of you that is watching us online, but <laughs> but what I leave, I leave it for another time, right? All right, so at this junction, I'm seeing some faces that I've never seen before. And I did not get a list of all the names of the persons that we have visiting. So if you're sitting beside somebody that you're seeing for the first time, I'm just going to ask you to shake that person's hand and welcome them to the Moncton SDA. Tell them that Jesus loved them and you love to see them again. So let's go. Shake that person's hand. Wel welcome them to Moncton SDA. Let them know that Jesus loved them and you would love to see them again. I'm seeing a stranger here, and I haven't seen Shani shake her hand as yet to tell her. I, I, come on, you're not following the instruction. <laughs> Has everyone gotten a greeting? I see the smiles on the face, and that is, that is lovely. Um, every one of us should be thankful that we are in the house. Amen? Because we are here means that we are alive. We might be in pain, but we are still in the house of the Lord, giving thanks. And that's a blessing. And yesterday, the world paused to recognize that Christ was what? Yesterday, the world paused to recognize that Christ was what? Was crucified. And that was yesterday was Good Friday. So whether you're joining us in the sacred place, virtually, you're present and rich our gathering today. And we unite in gratitude, celebrating the blessing bestowed upon us. May our worship together be filled with joy, fellowship, and appreciation for all that blessing that we will receive from the Lord. I pray that everyone feel welcome and they will stay welcome. And I also see Sister Celeste back with us. I, I spoke to Brother Gail yesterday and he told me that you would be here. So, welcome. We're happy to see you. We know you would prefer to have Brother Gail by your side, but in due time, so we welcome you. And you're looking like you turned 16 yesterday. So we give thanks. For, <laughs> we give God praise for that as well. Anyone else? We see Brother Lambert, who was out for a while, and he has returned. Amen, Bridget? So we, we, we are happy to see some of the members who were out sick returning and who were on vacation coming out. And we see, we see also... Sister Rebecca, you weren't here the last time, but we welcome you as well. And I trust that everyone will have a blessed Sabbath, and you will all gain a blessing for today's worship. Thank you all. Oh, sorry, my bad. We have a short announcement. Um, wasn't last, was it last week we went on the week before we had the youth went going out into the city? And we just want to give you a, a short recap of what transpired on, on that 
Sabat. Had the opportunity to be on the road with us that Sabbath, you would you would appreciate the opportunity that we had to share with others. When they share with you how grateful they were for us to come and worship with them and to just give them that small donation, they felt really appreciated. And just to go through a few announcements, you can check the bulletins for the additional information here. I'm just gonna go through a few of them. We have prayer meeting, which will be Monday and Wednesday at 5 a.m. in the morning. And you also has a uh, prior meeting that will start this Wednesday, April, in the evening as well, 7.30. And the vac Vacation Bible School is set to begin July 8 to 13, and they're in need of volunteers. So if you want to volunteer for the VBS, please see Sister Carleen as well. Um, you say Adra has opportunities for those who, are, who want to be for those who are talented individuals, passionate about making a positive impact, but you can, you can see the bulletin for that, so you can sign up for that campaign as well. At this junction, we're going to have the children story by Sister Monique Ramdeen. Before we get into our story, I'll ask that, can someone pray for the offering? Oh, lots of hands. Dear Lord, I thank you for everything you've done for all of us. All we ask is for you to bless us in the name of the Lord. We thank you for everything you've done. 
We pray to you for everything because you're our only God. Amen. Happy Sabbath, aunts and uncles. <laughs> All right, so this morning, the title of our story is A Praise Parade. What do you think it's talking about? What do you think it will talk about? I think it's that we should have a parade to offering something for God. It is the story when Jesus came to the town. Um, to praise God and fast. Okay. It's a time where we praise God. All right. So. We'll find out what this praise parade that we're going to read about this morning is. So it says, um, for what do you like to thank God for? What are some of the things we like to thank God for? Life. Shelter. We have lots of life and food to eat. How? <gasps> Trees. Trees. All right. Plants. Plants. Yes, there are so many things we like to give God thanks for. So Jesus and his friends were approaching the city of Jerusalem. Suddenly Jesus stopped. Go into that village over there, he said to two of his disciples. You will see a donkey tied up. It had never been ridden. Do we know what story that is now? All right. What story is it? It's the time where um, Jesus was riding a donkey through through the yeah, and they were yeah throwing things at him. It's a time where the king came. Right. So he said, "Untie it and bring it to me." If anyone asks you what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs it. Jesus needed the colt because he was about to do what, he prophet, what the prophet had said the Messiah would do. Your king is coming to you. He is gently and riding on a donkey. He is on a colt of a donkey. And we can find that in Zechariah 9 verse 9. In those days, kings rode into the city on big horses. They wanted everyone to know who they were. They wanted everyone to be afraid. Do you think Jesus wanted us to be afraid? No. Off, Jesus entered the city on a little donkey. Jesus never wanted people to be afraid of him. The disciples just knew that something special was going to happen. So they hurried off to do as Jesus asked. When they entered the village, they found a colt, just as Jesus had said they would. As they untied it, the owner asked them what they were doing. The disciples answered, the Lord needs it. Just as Jesus had said to do, and they led the little colt to Jesus. There was no saddle, so the disciples put coats on the colt. The road to Jerusalem was crowded. Fathers held their children on their shoulders so they could see Jesus. Mothers stood on tiptoe to watch. There were people there whom Jesus had healed, people who... People who had been blind, deaf, sick, and crippled. The people began to spread their coats on the road for the call to walk on. This is what people did for king in those days. The people also began to shout, Bless the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Bless the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Again and again, the people shout and sung praise to Jesus. 
Some of the religious leaders watch. They knew that the people were calling Jesus the Messiah, and they didn't like it. Teacher, they shouted from the side of the road, tell these people to stop saying these things. Jesus looked sadly at the religious leaders. He knew that they did not want to believe that he was really the Messiah. They did not like him. Jesus answered, if the people are quiet, then the stones along the road will cry out. It was time for everyone to know that Jesus was the Messiah, the one sent by God. It was time for everyone to make a choice. Would they believe in Jesus? Now I'm asking you, do you believe in Jesus? We all should, right? So you, the message for today's story is we worship Jesus when we praise him. All right, and I'm going to leave you with Luke 9, verse 38, and this is um, NIV version. It states, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. So as we go throughout this week, remember that when we worship, um, remember that we worship Jesus when we praise him. So when you wake up in the morning and you give God thanks for life, when you go to school, you come home, you're safe and all that, just give God the praise. All right? Who wants to pray? All right, we'll take two prior. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you have been protecting us. Thank you that for the Sabbath school lesson, thank you that we all arrived safely here and help us to arrive to our homes safe and sound. Keep your angels around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, Lord, thank you for this day. Please protect us and help us also to listen to you and to not do bad things and to do good to you and to listen to our friends to do good things also to you and not to do bad, not to listen to bad people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can go back to your seats. Amen. Amen, church. That was a beautiful story. Beautiful prayer from our children as well. Uh, we're going into our baby dedication, and I just want to share this scripture reading with us. Psalms 127, 3 to 5. As the persons who are going to have their baby dedicated make their way forward, and it says, Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man who quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they counted with their opponent in court. So blessed is the man who quiver is full of them. JB? All right, happy Sabbath, everyone. So at this time, we're going to ask the Badillo family. So we have Susanna and husband, and we have baby Milan Badillo to come forward at this time. Amen. Let's say amen and welcome them to the front. <laughs> and we invite pastor to come as well for a dedication. All right, just face the audience and I'll face you. All right. Are there any supporters, close friends, family that want to come and join them as well? You can if you're here. That's fine, yeah. You can, you can come if you want, yeah. Unless you want to keep stay there and get the camera view, it's up to you. Amen. Well, church, you know I love doing three things at church. Baptizing, I love marrying, well, officiating weddings, and I love blessing babies. And so I thank God every time I get to do one of those three things. And so today we have baby Mil Did he just sneeze? 
No? I thought I heard somebody sneeze. Anyway, that, that's, that's a good thing. Don't, don't feel badly if you did. Um, but here we have Baby Milan. And you know, I, I like researching the meaning behind names. I think names are significant. And names often influence the kind of people that we turn out to be. And so I'm glad that you both chose wisely the name for your son, Milan. Of course, we would know about Milan in Italy, yeah. Uh, but there is a meaning behind the name. And in Slavic, Slavic origin, it means gracious. It also means dear. Some may also say kind. Uh, but it's derived as well from in Milano, a Latin family name from ancient Rome, meaning eager, laborious, or rival. And so I'm going to use those meanings to give you both a charge as parents and extended family supporters. And I want to say that according to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 21, the Bible tells us after Hannah had prayed and uh, wrestled with God because she really wanted to have a baby, but it wasn't happening. But the Lord, it said, was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the firstborn boy, Samuel, the Bible said, grew up in the presence of the Lord. I want to suggest today that your son, Milan, is evidence of God's grace in your lives. God has been gracious to you, and he's evidence of that. And so just like Samuel, understand that Milan needs to grow up understanding that he, uh, he's smiling, you know his name, that's nice, that's nice, that's really nice. Get a shot, oh, there's, there's no camera? Okay, all right, okay. yeah. But he needs to understand that he really belongs to God. You see that? I swear it's the voice, eh? And that as, as you involve him in worship at home of God, that he lives in God's presence. But then his other name also means, from his Roman or Latin origin, eager, laborious, rival. I want to suggest today that the Bible in 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9 tells us that we ought to be alert and sober-minded because our enemy, and who's our enemy, church? The devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And then the Bible tells us to resist him standing firm in the faith. As you both introduce Milan to Jesus, also teach him that he can, as he gets older, resist the devil, who will come to him with many temptations, and the devil will flee from him as long as he remains in God's presence resisting the devil, standing firm in the faith that he will learn from you in Jesus Christ and his words. With that, I want to take you through three vows, parents. I'll pause after each one, almost like your wedding day. And as I pause, if you agree with the vow, the pledge, the promise, just say, we do. Okay, so the vow is, the first one says, do you understand that Milan is a gift of God and give heartfelt thanks for his blessing? Yeah. All right. Second one says, do you understand that Milan belongs to the Lord and that God has simply entrusted you both with his care and keeping to be brought up in the way of the Lord? Yes. Last vow says, do you here this day pledge as parents that you will use home, school, church, any means available, godly means available to help Milan grow up? in the fear and knowledge of God. Right. Now, church, here is your pledge and your promise. And because we're people of God, we won't lie. Amen, church? Amen. All right. So the pledge is, do you promise as a church family, do we promise that we'll support this family in the rearing of Milan through our prayers, our support, even if it means babysitting at church or whatever the means may, need may be? If God impresses you to provide some kind of help when needed, is this your pleasure and promise? Amen. 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 Now I'm going to call Elder Redain to come join me as we're going to bless this quiver, this arrow <laughs> in the quiver. So let me take the land. Mm -hmm. 
All right. He smiled. Will he cry? No, he doesn't. All right. Praise God. Now, Elder, yes, I need that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Milan needs something familiar to lean his face on. Yes. There you go. Thank you, Brother Clark. All right. Now, we will kneel together. All right. You, no, you can stay standing. You can stay standing, yeah? If he starts crying, I'm right back to you, okay? <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we praise your name for your son, your gracious gift, Milan. And I pray, Holy Father, that you will set a hedge of protection around him as his parents trust you with his life, as they trust you ultimately with his care. They can only do so much being human, but you are his keeper. And so I thank you, Lord, that you have already provided everything Milan needs during this tender stage of his life. And I pray that you will uh, impress upon his parents' hearts heavily each day that they are to lead him in the way to the Lord, that he may know Christ for himself based on his understanding as he grows, that he would learn to have Jesus as his friend, and that he would learn to follow Jesus as his parents lead the way. I pray that you would continually provide for the family's needs, temporally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, so that Milan will grow up in a safe, secure environment. And when need should arise, may you be the God who provides. I pray that if any illness should strike Milan's body, that you'd be the Lord who heals, that he would know that there is God and that you have all power. But ultimately, I pray that you would save Milan and his family, that when Christ returns, they will be ushered into eternity where he'll continue developing, yes, but without the risk of pain and sickness and loss. And so we thank you for these and many other blessings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, church. Well, Elder, I'm going to give you the privilege to hold baby Milan. Take, <laughs> take the receiving blanket first, though. And you present him to the church. All right. You got him? Yeah. You're, 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 you're two for one. Okay, good. All right. All right. Now, church, here is the newest blessed baby anywhere. Near Moncton. Come on. Praise God. Praise God. Our clerk is now coming to present the gifts and of our appreciation and for, help, for us helping you with blessing your son today. All right. All right. Praise God. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Amen, church? Amen. So if you haven't had your quiver full as yet, I hope that's encouragement. <laughs> encouragement? <laughs> um, so we'll now move into our praise and worship, after which we'll have the offertory by Sister Nicole St. Mart Martin, after which we'll have a garden of prayer by Brother JB. Uh, so we'll go in that order. So praise and worship.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Oh, I love that happy Sabbath at the back. If we could all be as loud as her. I mean, we are here praising God, aren't we? Amen. Aren't we here to praise God? Amen. Yes, we are. He died on the cross and rose again. He died for our sins. We indeed must give him praise, right? Yes. So as we are about to go into our praise and worship, we are just asking that you blend your voices, that you raise your hearts to Christ. Uh, the words will be on screen, so don't worry if you don't know the songs. You can sing along with us. All right? So as we go ahead, just send up a prayer for us so that we will not be seen, but Christ will. All right?
Good morning, church. Um, for our offerings, just a reminder, you can pay your offerings in that beautiful green box at the back, or you can also pay online at Mountain SDA donations. As our deacons come up for the offerings.
Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your love, and your grace. Dear Lord, as we are about to return our tithes and offerings, I ask that you will bless those who have to give. And Father, provide for those and continue to bless those who do not have to give. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I remember it was like yesterday. I got a call from a close friend saying that they had gotten an incredible job in an incredible city that would be their dream come true. I celebrated with my friend while also feeling the sting of pain from my own disappointment from recently being rejected from yet another job for which I was qualified yet was not found worthy to possess. Disappointment and rejection can be hard things to deal with. One thing that God taught me and my family during that season of our lives was that though it may not be my turn for the blessing of my dream job, it is always my turn to serve God and those around me by doing my best no matter what position, position I'm in. One thing that has blessed me and many others during tough times is the support local churches offer to those who are struggling just to make it. I've been in small group Bible study where other members prayed for me and supported me in many ways, both with physical needs and spiritual. Today's offering will go to support our local church budget, which supports ministries that are the heartbeat of our church all week long, not just on Sabbath. The Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Good morning, church. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Thank you so much. Um, today, we're going to pray together, but before we start praying, there's a few things we have to share together. The, the total lesson say, wait on the Lord. Are we all understand that, right? We have to wait on, on the Lord, no matter what we're going through. The good news is, he knows you by your name. He knows your address. He knows everything about you. And he's fight for you. Trust me, God is fighting for you, even while you're sleeping. Is there with you. He's always going to be there with you. Even you don't see him, but he's there with you. At this moment, we're going to kneel down. If you feel or you want to, we all can come together and pray together. Or if not, you can kneel down in your comfort zone and we pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be here today. It's not everyone who has that privilege to be here in this sanctuary. We come here to praise you, Father. As you give us a warning to wait on you. It's very hard for us sometimes when we're going through things to wait. But the disciples face those times as well. Even Jesus was in the boat with them. They still have to wait. If I ask each one of us a question, Father, we have something to wait on. But there is one thing we have to wait. is the second coming of Christ. And you tell us, closer is Christ. It's tough that things going to be. Because Jesus is not coming in the smooth times. Before his coming, there will be a lot on this earth. We ask you for strength 
to give us the power of the Holy Spirit to wait. And when you come, we all can be saved and rise and go with you. I ask you, please, Father, to visit the hospitals. We have some brothers and sisters suffering in the hospital. They need your help. Your hand is not too short to touch them. I ask you, please, to be with them. Those ones who are travel at this moment, take care of them. They all are your son and your daughter. As you say, all the power has been given to you from the heaven to the earth. You're not just our father and creator. You're taking care of us and you know us very well. Give us a special, a special blessings. I leave a pastor and your hand is about to preach. Let ease become your instrument. That everything is about to say it will be a blessing for each one of us. Guide us and protect us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's okay. All right. So we're about to go with the sermon. Just before we hear from Pastor, we're going to have the special song. And I see here Tovia Bennett. But I, I, um, last time I checked, she was Tovia Briffitt. I think it's the same person. Oh yes, Tovia Briffitt will, will bless us with the, 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 the special song. After that, you will hear from Pastor, and as JB rightly prayed, you pray that the Lord will use him like never before, and that we all will gain a blessing from the message that he has today. Uh, Tovia Briffitt. Jesus on the cross, the people cry. Looking on a man would think a tragedy, but what this world could. Was when they nailed him to that tree. It would break the chains of sin and set men free. Oh, and love grew where the blood. Sprang up for men in misery. Sin died where the blood fell. I'm so glad his precious blood. Violence and of hate 
were growing wildly And the sorrows they had spread Was clear to see Oh, but when the blood came flowing down the cross When my Jesus bled and died It broke the chains of sin and set men free You know, this day, this weekend, we don't care about Easter bunnies that don't exist or bunnies that lay eggs. But we care about and we give God thanks for, especially during this season, the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. What do you say? And so as your neighbors get caught up in the secular festivities of the season, remind them that it should be all about Jesus. Amen? Don't get caught up being too conservative. Use the season as an open door to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. What do you say? Amen. Amen. Before we get going, I just want to take us through the mission statement again. We need to do it every Sabbath until we get it. And so it's on the screen. 
It says, through love, what happens? Touching whom? Hope and wholeness. Preparing? Amen. So the key word there is we reach, we touch, but it's all through love to prepare believers for the second coming of Christ. All believers say amen. Amen. But then Jesus said, other sheep I have not of this fold as yet them I will bring in. And so he will use us to connect with those sheep as well. Amen? Amen. To bring his believing family, his sheep, his children home. And that his spirit may continue preparing us all for the return of Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news, church? You know, I have something for you, and I'm very happy for it. I just want to ask for our communications uh, team just to wave your hand. Sister Monique, I see you there. Yes, yes, yes. And Brother Clark, I see you there. Who else is there? Sister Priscilla, I see you. There are others as well whose name I forgot, so please forgive me. Don't kill me. But if you're here, just raise your hand. Communications team members, don't be shy. I'll check my paper and see if I missed you, and I'll call you out next Sabbath if I'm here. I won't be here, by the way. All right. So why I'm so happy is because we have, I know we had a newsletter at one time, but now we have grown from a newsletter to a church magazine. Amen, church? No, the face, just the first issue, okay? <laughs> this wasn't my doing, by the way, just to let you know. Our, uh, uh, our editor-in-chief is Brother Ergard and Clark, so you can talk to him about why my face is here. Uh, I am just the general editor, Elder Andre's associate editor, Sister Monique is our associate editor as well. So now listen, we need to get these in your hands. It'll, there will be a soft copy, but don't think about that. It's good to have the hard copy in hand, what do you say? And when I saw the first draft, I was elated. This thing is better than some conference, I said some conference publications. So don't make it specific. I didn't tell you which one I'm thinking about. It's not ours since we're online, just so you all know that. But um, we have a coloring page for kids. Yes, created by our own sister Priscilla Polno. Amen, somebody? Don't look so shy. We're celebrating your gift. Amen. (laughs) Amen. Uh, We have testimonies from, uh, yeah, Matthew Tom's testimony. Cassandra Murray, Gianna Gardner, Tavia Watson. The very first article in here is from by our own president, Pastor David Miller. And some of you have also written articles in here as well, and so we give God thanks for that. We highlight our youth. uh, We highlight baptisms. We highlight community services. So many good things in here. I'm not going to spoil it for you because you won't buy it. I mean, get your copy. But if you would like to have a printed copy, it's good to keep these things, you know. Uh, please see Brother Clark right after church. There's a subscription. It's minimal. It's a quarterly issue, okay? So every three months, of course. But see him for more information on the subscription to get your own copy. Is that all right, church? But then as well, um, as we celebrate God's goodness to us and publish that for all to know, we also pause to uh, remember those of our church family who are hurting And because we do live in this world where sin has ravaged us, don't we? So I want us all to keep in mind uh, to pray for, call, encourage, help as needed, as bid by the Holy Spirit, the Del Hunty family. Um, As some of you may know, Brother Len's father passed away just this week. Also, um, Brother Everton uh, Gale, I don't know why I had Clark, Egerton, Clark, brother, Everton Gale, Sister Gale is right here, is in the hospital, and so please, 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 uh, not only pray for, but provide support as needed as you speak with the family, or as the Holy Spirit bids you during this time. It is a trying time, a tiring time, a stressful time. But it's good to have a church family. What do you say? Also, do keep in mind as well our dear sister, Yana DeBay, who as well is in hospital, but not just in hospital. She's in palliative care. The doctors at this time say that after all their specialties, all their tests, that there is nothing they can do. And so that may be the case. But I thank God that we have the great physician 
who is not just bound by this temporal, temporary life, but he dwells in the past, the present, and the future, and with him there is always healing. Amen, somebody? And so please keep her in prayer. Pray for her soul, that it will remain right with the Lord. Many of you have been visiting her quite a bit, and I know she appreciates that, though she's unable to speak. But please do keep her in prayer and visit as you can. The doctors are not too hopeful about the imminent future as far as our sister is concerned. Let us now open the word as we look at what the Lord has for us today. There is a cure. There is a cure. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I am sick. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, but thank God there is a cure. Now, the neighbors hope to first is quite happy there's a cure because they're probably wondering what in the world you have. But don't worry, we all have the same disease. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you. I want to praise your holy name that there is a cure, that there is the great physician, that we have these wonderful truths and words and this gospel available to us even right now. So as we pause to contemplate and give God thanks for the cure, for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, I pray that the word would breathe life back into our souls. May the Holy Spirit quicken our souls, meaning raise us up from the slumber of sin, from the burdens of this life, and give us revived spiritual life and hope in this world for the world to come. May we be humble under his leading that he may continue preparing us for the return of Jesus Christ. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, there is a cure. God's intended purpose for creating human beings was that we reflect his character and likeness. In other words, we were made, church, family, and friends, to be like God. Y'all got that? We're made to be like God. That's why the Bible, Genesis 1, verse 26, then God said to himself, <laughs> he said, come, let's make man in our image after our likeness. The Hebrew from which we get the word image uh, is the Hebrew word selem, and it can mean physical resemblance as of a statue. So think of uh, some pea folk of renown in history. Uh, of whom they've made statues. That's a selem. But as well, the word from which we get likeness, the Hebrew word demuth, can mean physical resemblance as well as character. And so God's original purpose in creating man was seen in, I'm going to highlight six ways, but there are more. But the first way in which we were made perfectly to reflect God's image and his character, we'll see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And I suggest, by God's word, that the first way is that we re resemble God by being moral beings. What did I say? That means we have an ethical responsibility. Give me one second. <laughs> Amen, somebody. We're made to reflect God being moral beings. We have an ethical responsibility to God. Genesis 1, verse 26 said, Then God said, Let's make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion. Someone say dominion. Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. We had an ethical responsibility to take care of God's creation. Y'all got that? But then Genesis 2 verse 16 and 17 says, and God the commanded, Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Someone say, mmm. But the tree of not good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. We had an ethical responsibility upon creation to make wise decisions based on God's instruction 
not on our feelings. You all got that? And so, we were made to reflect God by being moral beings. Second way is that we were made to reflect God's image and likeness by being social beings. Turn to your neighbor and say, I need you. Your neighbor and say, like, you need me. That means that we were to be, have and maintain interpersonal relationships through marriage, kinship, that's family relations and friendships. That's why Genesis 1, 27, 28 says the following, that so God made man in his own image, in the image of God he created them, listen carefully, male and female, he created them. That's it. Then God blessed them, I'll come back to this later on, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then Genesis 2, verses 18 to 24, lets us know that the Lord looked at Adam and determined that it was not good that Adam should live without having a helper comparable to him. I'll define that later when I go back to male and female. But then it says later on in that passage that Adam himself, after observing all the animals, did not find a helper comparable to him. That's very important when trying to find, by the Lord's leading, a lifetime spouse, a life partner, as some people say that you need someone comparable to you. Y'all got that? Y'all got that? Some of you are quiet. Yes, thank you, brother. I heard that. And so back to male. Now, in the Hebrew, male comes from the Hebrew word zakar. Everyone say zakar. In the original sense, this word means or points towards something that is sharp. Stay with me. Something that's elongated, an object. Y'all got that? In other words, it's talking about the male sexual organ. Y'all understand that? And then the word from which we get female in the Hebrew, nakaba. Everyone say nakaba. Also refers to the female sexual organ. Now, it is very important to understand that it's talking about the human anatomy. It's not just talking in generic uh, gender terms. Okay, y'all got that? And so because God is so specific and because he says to them in the same two verses after male and female, be fruitful and multiply, it only makes sense as social beings, this time in the context of marriage, that only a male, true male, and only a female, true female, married together in holy wedlock, can reflect perfectly the image and likeness of God. Y'all got that? Y'all got that? That's why two men together will never reflect the image and likeness of God. That's why two women together never reflect the image and likeness of God. That's why someone that claims to be transgendered will not reflect the image and likeness of God. Y'all got that? Because if we miss one component of it, we've missed the whole thing. And so God made human beings reflect his image even in marriage because our God is creator, but he privileged us with the gift of procreation. Y'all got that? Y'all got that? And so don't believe any garbage. Yes, sin is a disease. I'll come to that later. That has tainted and tarnished everything about God's image and character within us. Don't subscribe the devil's doctrine that tells anything else exists outside of male and female in God's original plan and intent for us to reflect his image and his character. So, the third way that we're made to reflect his image and character is by being intellectual beings. You all got that? Intellectual. That means we were made to be rational thinkers. We are made to also care for creation and to have mental health. Genesis 2, 19 says, Out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Imagine God, creator of heaven and earth, 
sovereign, all-knowing God, gave Adam his created being, the privilege of joining him not in creation, but in naming his creation on earth. Isn't that amazing? How good God is. And the Bible says in verse 19, chapter 2, Genesis, that whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. The image here is that God made us to be creative, to be rational. God made us with the ability to care for his creation. And so we have a responsibility as we came from the creator's hand, as Adam did, to care for, to be rational, to, uh, and to grow and to learn in our intellect. As we spend time in nature and the word, God expects that we continue to grow intellectually in our understanding and maturity. Y'all got that? That's why there is no excuse for anyone who is able to understand and to observe nature and to read and grasp what we read, to have shallow or immature thinking. After a while, as we encounter life and experience the Lord, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, there ought to be a, a demonstrated growth in our intellectual ability. It's said here in the book, Education, page 15, that when Adam came from the Creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental, and spiritual nature a likeness to his Maker. It said it was his purpose, as God's purpose, that the longer man lived, the more fully he should reflect the image of his creator. It said that all his faculties were capable of development. Y'all got that? Adam and Eve's perfection was not in the sense that they were made complete, not to grow in their understanding or in their relationship. They were made perfect in character, but it was always God's intent that humanity continue to grow in intellect, understanding, and experience. Y'all got that? That hasn't stopped since sin. And then the fourth way we're made to reflect God is by being emotive beings, meaning that we experience, that we express creativity and emotion. Sometimes we're afraid of emotion and to express that in a healthy way, but we have been made emotive beings. You all understand that? And then we can express our emotions through creativity. As long as we live our lives in spirit and truth, nothing is wrong with the way that we feel. Y'all got that? I said in spirit and truth. And so we see here that we see it was expressed, Genesis 2.23, when Adam saw Eve, he broke out in poetry. And Adam says, now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. That was poetry of the highest order. As a matter of fact, that was love poetry. Y'all got that? Now I got some work to do. I'm guilty of something. I used to write poetry letters to my wife before we married. But since we married, you know, I, you know. But there's nothing wrong with expressing yourself creatively. It's your emotions, y'all got that? Don't be afraid of expressing emotions in a healthy way. And the same thing reflects to our worship. The same thing reflects to our daily lives, where we love at home. We are made to be emotive. Our friendships, we're made to express emotion and be creative in healthy ways. The fifth way is by being physical beings. We're made to work, to experience, to experience recreation and sexuality. I already spoke about that in Genesis 1, 27-28. Genesis 2 verse 15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it. I want to suggest today that God did not make any lazy children. The devil did that. Matter of fact, sin did that. And so if you know anyone in your life that's lazy, provoke them to good works. The church say amen. If it's your husband, provoke him to good works. If it's your wife, well, encourage her to good works. Amen, somebody? <laughs> you don't want to provoke her. It might end too well. Yeah, Brother Marvin said, yeah, well, you're, you're shaking your head, yes. But we were made to be productive. 
not on a nine to five clock, but in a creative way because we're made perfect in that way to express, to make, to tend, to care for, to produce. And I would love to see what Adam and Eve did their garden home when we get to heaven, wouldn't you? They all don't want to go to heaven, so let me keep on preaching. The sixth way is we're made spiritual beings. Everyone say spiritual beings. Genesis 2 verse 3 says, Then God blessed the seventh day, everyone say Sabbath, and sanctified, everyone say made holy, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. But then Genesis 1 28 says that God blessed them, that's Adam and Eve. You all with the word still? Huh? that God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, here is the sanctification part now, their purpose, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion and care. Understand something that God blessed one thing at creation, and God also blessed a family at creation. Y'all got that? And so when something, when someone's blessed in scripture, that means that we ought to be happy, to be joyful. And that also means that God sanctifies or makes the thing or the people he blesses holy. We all on the same page? So being blessed, Adam and Eve were made spiritual beings. They were made holy by a holy God to reflect his holy image and character. That makes sense, church? Let's keep moving. Well, truth is that Satan's sinful strategy has been to deface, deform, and destroy the image of God upon and within humanity completely. So I suggest today, friends and family, that sin is like leprosy. Truth is that sin is a disease with no natural cure. There is no vaccine for it, no procedure against it. Sin is hereditary. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 51 verse 5 that I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin, my mother conceived me. Sin is debilitating. Romans 5 verse 8 said, For when we were still without strength, sin saps your strength from you. But thank God that Christ died for the ungodly. Sin is a terminal illness. That's Romans 6 23 says, The wage of sin is death, but the gift, somebody say, praise God, of God is, is through Christ, is eternal life is through Christ Jesus our Lord. Gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Sin affects the whole person. The Bible said that the whole head is sick. Anyone sick today? You all said yes at the beginning, so don't say no now. We're all sick from the head to the toe. There is no soundness in our voice, in our beings. We're like we have putrefying sores. We're ill. Not even natural ointment can cure the symptoms and the disease of sin because sin is more critical than cancer more deadly than depression diabetes or dementia and easier to acquire than aids that's why the paralytic lord through the roof jesus said to him not first he didn't say to him first he said he didn't say first be healed but christ said to him first that man your sins are forgiven Truth is that Jesus knew that the burden this man carried for months had little to do with his illness, but much to do with the burden of sin that he carried. And so that's why I want to suggest that sin isn't contagious, but that sin is in our DNA. All we have to do to get it is be born. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Truth is, there's absolutely nothing that you and I can do to make ourselves better before God. Genesis 2, verse 3, verse 7 says, Then the eyes of them both, Adam and Eve, were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings or aprons. The Hebrew word for the word coverings is hagor, and in the context of Genesis 3, verse 7, it means a waist cloth or loin covering. 
In other words, Adam and Eve just sewed fig leaves together enough to cover their reproductive organs. Everything else was bare. You all see the picture right now? They didn't cover their whole bodies. Just fig leaves enough to cover the reproductive organs. And that's interesting because those organs were meant by God's purpose to reflect his image and likeness by being productive, reproductive, as he is creator. We're made to procreate, but now sin has made that shameful. Isn't that a shame, somebody? The truth is today, friends, that Isaiah lets us know that we are all like an unclean thing that our righteousness is, that's our good acts that we do of our own accord, are nothing more than filthy rags. It says that we all fade like a leaf. Eventually, because of sin, those fig leaves would have faded that have to sow new fig leaves. Truth, it doesn't matter what good works you do to obey your bad works or your sinfulness or your badness, whatever you want to say. Those good works are inadequate to cover the real issue, the shame and disgrace of the disease of sin. You all believe that? But I thank God for this, that the word tells us in Genesis 3 verse 21 that God himself made, didn't sew it together, but he made, he fashioned. He was a first fashion designer. He made tunics. A tunic in the Hebrew is a long shirt-like garment that covered their complete beings. You all see the picture in your mind? And so God made this for them, not from linen, but from the skins of an animal. That means that something had to die because of their sin. You all got the picture? And so this was symbolic of Jesus coming to die because of our sins. And because of his death, we are gifted with his robe of righteousness. It's something right now that's spiritually discerned. But praise God, when we get to heaven, we'll get to see it physically as he will restore us in the glow and the light that comes from him. You all believe the word today? And so that's why I thank God today that Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful. You're joyful this morning? Are you joyful this morning? If you are, say amen. For my God, he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, the bride adorns herself with jewels. Today, I want to suggest by illustration there is a cure. There's a difference between conventional medicine and functional medicine. You heard those from before? conventional medicine and functional medicine. You see, today in the Western world, doctors are schooled in conventional medicine. Now, what that means is conventional medicine is more concerned with symptom care or symptom management. And so you go there with pain in your head and your belly and your foot, and they'll give you maybe some Tylenol, some extra strength to take care of that. You go back, the same problems there. Maybe you're dizzy, they'll give you medication to take care of dizziness. But it's symptom management. Even the procedures, the surgeries, are symptom management. Very little concerned with the root cause, what's causing all these things to happen. But then we have functional medicine, which is not something that's practiced very much here in North America or the Western world, which is, which is concerned about the root cause behind the symptoms that we're experiencing. And so they'll do tests to find the root cause and then to treat or cure that thing. So you stop experiencing the symptoms and don't live like a medicated or whatever for the rest of your life. Y'all got the picture? And so I want to suggest today, friends, that in the spiritual sense, there is conventional medicine and there is functional medicine. I want to suggest in the spiritual sense that sometimes, just as we looked at in today's Sabbath school discussion, many times we find ourselves erring like any good doctor as a specialist, focusing on symptoms of others and ourselves, spiritual symptoms, whatever they may be of lying or cursing or stealing or whatever the addiction may be. And we try to correct those symptoms because all we can see are the symptoms. Y'all with the word today still? 
But I thank God that there is the great physician who sees beyond skin deep. Y'all got the word? And he is not concerned with conventional spiritual medicine. He goes to the heart of the, of, of the problem. He goes to the heart. He goes to the root, which is sin. And he has the only cure for it. And he is the one I need to consult for my problems and not get caught up with the symptoms. Y'all got the word today? And so that's why we find ourselves sometimes spinning around for years and for months with the same problem and new problems coming up because we find ourselves so consumed trying to solve and cure the symptoms when God has the ultimate solution. What do you say? As a matter of fact, he said, I'm going to give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. It doesn't matter how well that pork is jerked or dressed or roasted. The pork is to the dirty old swine. Y'all got the word? doesn't matter how well you dress that thing up. There needs to be a heart transplant to remove and purge the sin from the soul so that there can be healing. Amen, somebody? And so, in the book Life Sketches of Ellen and James White, it said here, no matter how bold and earnest one may be in his claims of spiritual soundness and perfection of character, if he lacks Christian grace and humility, the dregs of the disease of sin is in his nature or her nature. And unless it is purged from him or her, he or she cannot enter the kingdom of God. Anybody want to go to heaven? Anybody want to be in eternal life when Christ returns? Well, the, in the, the encouragement today is allow the Holy Spirit to purge the dregs of sin from our lives. Somebody say amen. amen. I have good news. Do you want to hear it? You don't want to hear it. I have great news. Do you want to hear it? Amen. The great news today is that there is a cure for the sin-sick soul. Somebody say amen. amen. I want to suggest that this was revealed in two ways. First, through the, the greatest promise. That's what? The greatest what? Genesis 3, 15, Jesus says in the Garden of Eden, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, the devil, and the woman, and between your seed, common S, and her seed, singular, capital S, that's Jesus. He will bruise, that's to crush your head, Satan. You will only be privileged to bruise or crush his heel. Understand something that this first and greatest prophecy and promise of the scriptures by Jesus Christ himself says that they will reveal that this promise will be fulfilled in three ways. First, that God would create himself hatred between the Savior and Satan and between sinners and saints. Y'all got that? Y'all got that? Y'all with the word today? That's why in John 8 verse 44, Jesus says to the proud and boastful Jews, he says to them, you are of your father the devil. Uh, you, you know anyone, anyone like, like, like that today? Are they here? Don't look at them. Just hear the word. You are of your father the devil. And he said the desires of your father you want to do. You all got that? You see, once we're living in sin, we want to sin. Does that make sense? That straight Bible. And Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. He said when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Someone said the devil's a liar. Understand that I'm so glad that even the devil's a liar that we have Jesus who says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through whom? Someone say Jesus. So the devil is a liar. Don't let him have control over your life. Somebody say amen. That's why Amos 3.3 3 asked the question, can two walk together unless they are agreed? That's why some relationships you're trying to force aren't working out, because sin and sinners and saints really can't perfectly coexist. Y'all got that? Because there is natural enmity between Christ and Satan, between the Savior and Satan. So there will naturally be enmity between the children of Christ and the children of the devil. Does that make sense? 
But praise God that there is no bounds to which the love of Christ cannot reach, that even sinners can become sinners saved by grace. All the sinners saved by grace say amen. Understand that John 3, 9-20 tells us that this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. Because why? Just like cockroaches, their deeds are evil. And so when the light shines on their deeds, they run for darkness, that they themselves will not see the sin that has so taken over their souls. Y'all got the word? That's why John 15 says, the world hates you. But you should know it hated me before it hated you. And Christ said that if you were of the world, it would love you. Yet because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now we ought to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. And the gentle instruction there is do not go seeking trouble. Y'all got that? Now there are some Christians who make themselves like warriors. They have a Messiah complex. They want to save everything, destroy everything evil, offend everybody that they might save some. But the truth is that we ought to be wise as serpents but harmless as doves. Only the Holy Spirit can give us that wisdom and love. So as we even live the gospel and share the gospel, word of mouth will be done through love. Huh? In a way, and as we relate with people, we join people in the godly things, becoming all things to all men that we, by the power of the gospel, might save some. Y'all got that? And so, the truth is, don't force relationships that are not meant to be. Second way that the greatest promise is revealed is that the Savior would be born of a woman. Isaiah 7, 14 says, The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. The Savior. Third way, will defeat the devil. Somebody say amen. amen. And so beginning with the war in heaven, where Revelation 12 said that there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought, the devil and his angels fought. Understand that Michael is the warrior title for Jesus. It's the same title used in, in Daniel chapter 12 when he stands up for his people. And the truth is, friends, as long as we remain with Christ and he's within us and with us, we won't have to fight our battles. Somebody say amen. That's why he said, I will fight your battles for you because he is the Lord who is great. He's a commander of angelic armies. He is the Lord, our redeemer. He's the Lord, our warrior. And so I want to suggest today, even once you have Christ in your life, uh, once he's fighting for you, before the battle begins, it's already won. Somebody say amen. And so I want to suggest that I come to a close. That the second way, the second way that we experience the cure is by the fact that there has been offered the greatest sacrifice. First, we had the greatest promise, but then we have the greatest sacrifice. First of all, I skipped something. Jesus is our warrior. The fight begun in heaven. On the cross, it continued on earth when Christ died on the cross. But understand that at the cross is where Jesus crushed the head of Satan, our chief enemy and adversary. I'm so glad that we're told in Hebrews 2.14 that through death, Jesus destroyed the power of death. And the power of death resides in the devil. And so I give God thanks that he crushed the devil's head at the cross. Somebody say amen. amen. And the third way this will be finally done, as we looked at in Sabbath school lesson this morning, is that it will be finally completed, the, the war that is, the crushing of Satan, when he is finally destroyed in the fires of hell. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Now, as I come to a close, the greatest sacrifice provides the only cure for sin. And we're told in Isaiah 53, you can go up quickly, Isaiah 53, 
You read on your own time what the whole thing because time is going. But in verse 5, it says that Jesus, the prophecy now, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And that word bruise really means crushed. And so Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. That's the things that we love doing. Y'all got that? I haven't yet met a person, including myself, who sinned and never liked doing it. You meet someone who said, I hate doing sin, living in sin, they're lying. But once God begins working on your heart, he'll give you the heart that he gave to Job, and you'll begin hating sin for the sickness that it is. Y'all got the word? So while living in sin, we love doing it. But thank God that with a new heart, we begin to hate it and overcome it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. And the word says that by his stripes, somebody say stripes, we are healed. That word stripes means blows that cut in. Listen carefully. Jesus was scourged. He was whipped the scourge. That's in John 19 verse 1. Historians suggest that the Roman instrument of choice for scourging was the flagrum. Everyone say flagrum. Flagrum. Say flagrum. Stay with me. Stay flagrum. It's a short whip made of two or three uh, leather ropes joined to a handle. The leather ropes were knotted with small pieces of bone or metal, sometimes zinc or iron, sometimes as well bronze or bones. This whip, this flagrum was designed to rapidly remove skin and flesh from the victim. The Roman flagrum made deep lacerations, torn flesh, exposed muscles, and extreme bleeding that rendered the victim half dead. As a matter of fact, death was the common outcome of such punishment. But since scourging was often preceded or often followed by crucifixion, it was necessary to keep the victim alive even after being scourged to be publicly executed on the cross. And so the half-dead victim had to drag a beam all the way from the place of scourging to the place of execution. Truth is today, friends, that Jesus, after being scourged, was too weak to carry his own cross. They had to find a black man from Africa named Simon to help carry his cross. Truth is, Isaiah 53, verse 5, prophesies that Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised. That means he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement, the punishment for our peace was laid upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Somebody say amen. amen. Jesus prophesies through Isaiah, in chapter 50, verse 6, he says, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Today, I want to suggest and encourage the people of God by saying again that there is a cure for the sin-sick soul. Amen, somebody? And that cure is not a vaccine in a vial. That cure is the blood of Jesus that flowed from a crudely crafted cross at Calvary. That blood where it fell, love grows. And where that blood fell, sin died. Where that blood fell, it gave you and me hope to be cured from the incurable disease of sin naturally because spiritual sickness is a spiritual cure. You all got the word? And so thank God for the cure, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. But the story doesn't end there. You see, Jesus died on Friday, rested in the tomb on Sabbath. Then early Sunday morning, he rose from the grave with power in his life. And then he sent to the Father in heaven after spending some days here, sent to find the Father in heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father as our representative, as our intercessor, as our judge and our mediator, as our everlasting lamb, as our soon coming king. And the truth is today, the reason why he did all of this for us is simply because of the goodness of God. Today, understand that it's God's goodness why you and I are here. 
Understand that his goodness leads us to repentance. Understand that his goodness will take us from earth to heaven. Because goodness is not just what he does, but goodness is who God is.
with every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen, church? Today, very simply, if you understand and you appreciate the fact that God is faithful, faithful to his word, faithful to who he is, faithful is who he is. Amen, somebody? And if you're also happy that God's goodness follows you, even chases after you every day, even right now, even when doing bad all by yourself, his goodness still follows you. His voice still calls after you, wondering, when are you going to answer? When are you going to submit and surrender all to him? He is love. He's full of love. He gives love. He's forgiving. He's gracious. He's tender-hearted. He is wondering, when will we finally give in that he may work within us salvation, that we might receive eternal life, that we will live lives not being victims, but victors, overcoming the devil daily. Hebrews tells us that Jesus, he destroyed death by dying, but then raising himself from the grave. We're told elsewhere in the word as well that Jesus will crush Satan in our lives and place him under our feet. If you want to have Satan crushed and placed under your feet, to no more have dominion over you. You were made to have dominion, not, not be dominated. Satan came and deceived us that you can be like God, that he might dominate and control us and destroy us. But Christ came that we might be free, that we might have life and hope. Today, I don't know what your story is, but as you stand, if you want to express your thankfulness, your praise to God for his goodness, for his faithfulness, and if you want to, you're coming forward, if you want to say, Lord, help me to surrender my all to you. Fight my battles for me. I can't do it. I'm tired. I don't know what you're fighting. But ultimately, you understand that the real issue is not the symptom or symptoms of sinfulness or acts of sin but the issue is the sin within us and you want to say lord i receive the overcomer's power i receive salvation i receive forgiveness i receive jesus into my life i give you my battles fight them for me as you're coming forward if there's anyone here today that hasn't yet given your life to jesus Never made that commitment. Never said, Lord, I surrender all to Jesus. Never confessed your sins, received his forgiveness. Never been baptized as a public expression that you're giving your life to Christ and turning your back on Satan and sin. And you want to say, Lord, I want to be baptized. I want to give my life to Jesus with every eye closed, every head bowed. If that's you, just raise your hand. If you're joining us online, you can scan the QR code on your screen. We can help you take the step toward committing all to Jesus through baptism. But if you're here right now, just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. I want to pray with you. Are you here? Haven't yet given your life to Christ? Haven't yet been baptized? You want to say, Lord, I surrender all to Jesus. I want to experience the power of the blood in my life to overcome sin, to be a victim, to be a victor, not a victim, that you may fight my battles, that I may overcome and be cured from the sin within me. Let us pray, Father. We thank you, we praise your holy name because you are good, because you are faithful, because you are God. 
And today we give you praise because yet again we've been reminded that where the blood flowed, sin died. So I pray now that you let the blood flow through each and every one of us right now, that sin would die within us today, that the Holy Spirit would continue his work of preparing us for the return of Jesus Christ. I pray that as the blood flows through us, that we would experience your love and share that love with others. So by experiencing Jesus, others would also come to Christ and come to know him as their Savior. God, I pray that you would give us the overcomer's uh, power. Help us to daily resist the devil. Even right now, someone struggling with something. The symptom or symptoms of sin. But help, not only from the symptom perspective, but help from the root cause, which is sin. Please keep removing sin from our lives so that we don't practice sin. Help us that we will not keep sin under the covers of leaves that fade, trying to appear good before others. But help us that we will take the robe of Christ's righteousness so it won't be our good deeds, but his working through us and from within us. Help us to truly be like Christ. Help us not to be actors, but help us to be sinners saved by grace. Help us to live as saints, as blessed people, holy, set apart for you. Help us to experience the joy that comes by being in Jesus Christ. Help us not to fake joy with happiness that passes, but give us the joy, the contentment, the peace, irrespective of the circumstance. Because not only is the Holy Spirit greater within us than the devil in the world, but as long as Jesus Christ is our warrior, the devil, that the battle against sin and Satan has already been won. And so we thank you that there is a cure, that we will be finally delivered from sin and all its consequences. We look forward to the day when Christ returns to take us all to heaven. We look forward to that day after the thousand years when we will see Satan, sin, and those who follow him in sin be finally destroyed by their choosing in the lake of hell, never to rise again, because sin will never raise its ugly head again. Never will there be disease through your universe ever again. Keep us faithful. Keep us true. Keep us firm in the faith of Jesus Christ. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. stand for the closing hymn at the cross number 163.
Amen, church? Come on, I think we all got the, the, the cure for our sin sick disease. Amen, church? Amen. So we, as we separate from the, the house of the Lord, I leave this reading with you. It says, If you did lightly heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ears to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on, which, on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Exodus 15, verse 26. I pray that we will all stay blessed throughout the remaining portion of the Sabbath. And remember, it is good. It is a blessing to do good on the Sabbath day. Uh, you can remain standing and the, our deacons will come and usher you out as I turn over to the priest. Hey, you may be seated. And wait, uh, wait to be ushered out by the deacons at this junction. Dismiss us, Lord, with blessings we pray, as from thy worship we go our ways, thine in life's conflicts all through the Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace.
Why? Why? Why Jesus? Why all the talk of crucifixions and the resurrection of the dead? The idea that our present reality can be radically transformed by one historical day from antiquity. Why does this one event persist to shake nations, stands against kingdoms, relentlessly remaining there in every test in time? Why does the life of one rabbi bring hope to the billions and peace beyond understanding, peace even in facing death? His axioms transcend culture, moving between and among every generation, offering new grace with each day to the poor and to the rich, to the young and to the old, each who calls his name. This is not just a page between the chapters of history, neither myth, metaphor, nor a line of spectacular exaggeration. His influence on every human life story is unfit to be placed into any existing category. No, Jesus isn't written into our story. Rather, our story is written into his. Every authority, even the grave, obeys his sovereign will. This is why we exalt the mighty name of Jesus over and over and over again. His victory has given us life. His mercies stand at the center of our faith. He alone holds the pen of history. He is the one true God, and at that, a God who died for us. Why rejoice? Why is this our anthem? The answer for why Jesus comes down to this. Jesus is at the center. His victory over the grave is written into every line. Between old and new, between death and life, there stands one historical reality, the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus.